So we, we looked at adaptation risks, issues, and then mitigation, how the cost changes and how the reduction in consumption is required based on what options of emissions we choose. These are some common factors uh, in implementation of adaptation and mitigation. So you can make a lot of plans, but when you want to implement them, there are a lot of practical constraints. So these are the constraining factors which range for adverse externalities of population growth and urbanization. The term externality is something that comes from various economic and social science disciplines. Essentially, it means something that is not directly related to the problem you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with climate change and you're trying to make some adaptation, then population growth and urbanization are not directly related, but they are part of the problem that you have to deal with. So the implications for adaptation, of course, more population means the exposure or the people exposed to extreme climates or other climate events like floods, heat waves will increase. And for mitigation, it means it affects economic growth, energy demand, energy consumption, and so on. So there are various topics here that uh, I won't go into each detail, but you can see the constraining factors, deficits of knowledge and education, and human capital, the expertise to do it, divergences in social and cultural attitudes, values, and behavior. So depending on whether it's a rich country or a poor country, a rich community or a poor community, urban community, rural community, how values are determined by the groups of people dealing with the issues, whether it's a park, whether it's air quality, water quality, depends on where you are and what kind of background you come from, what is your cultural and ethnic background and so on. There are obviously challenges in governance and institutional arrangements. For example, in a heavy flood, who takes the decisions of, let's say, releasing the water when the dam is filling up and so on. So lots of issues involved at all time scales. Lack of access to national and international climate finance. For example, I mentioned Typhoon Haiyan hitting Philippines and causing excess damage because it got potentially much stronger than it should have been because of the warming ocean, which is related to climate change. So who's going to pay for it, whether Philippines has access to it, not just internationally, but even within a nation. If one state is get flooded, then how is it able to access the central government funds and the rescue and search operations, etc.? Inadequate technology, always an issue, uh, depending on whether you are from the global south or the global north, depending on how much it costs, and so on. Insufficient quality or quantity of natural resources. So if you depend on energy for other, uh, on other countries, you have to import it, then that obviously will be a constraining factor for adaptation and mitigation. And generally, adaptation and development deficits. So obviously the status of the economy matters and inequality. This is working at both regional and local scales, at state and national scales, as well as international scales. So who controls the power, the wherewithal, the finances, or even entities like the UN, etc., often play into these. So the potential for uh, adaptation range for Perceptions of risks, which again depends on how you see the risk of climate change given the projections and even given what is happening. If, you, if it floods this year and it doesn't flood for three years, will you think that this was just a one-off event and may not happen again? How many times does it have to occur? Any event have to occur for a community to accept that this is a risk? And how long is the risk? how much you are willing to pay, and so on. So we'll come back to this when we talk about behavioral issues. So societal consensus on climate risk is always an issue. The ability to coordinate adaptation policies, measures, and to deliver capacity to actors to plan and implement. So if the central government decides something and says you should put more forests, 
more energy, renewable energy, better usage of water, saving groundwater, etc. Then how do you enable the local actors to implement these strategies and adaptation uh, policies? Um, reduces the, the potential implication of adaptation is also that it reduces the scale of investment in adaptation policies and hence its effectiveness. The numbers in here are so-called working groups, working group 2, so the IPCC report, the assessment report 5 is prepared by several groups focused on the physical science basis, impacts, vulnerability and risks, adaptation, mitigation and so on. So I am not going to mention more than that. So the potential implication reduces the range of available adaptation options when you have inadequate technology, insufficient quality and quantity would reduce the coping range of actors, vulnerability to non-climatic factors and so on. The development deficit would increase vulnerability to current climate vulnerability as well as future climate change. So if a group is living with poor infrastructure, poor housing, building codes and so on, then if more development does not come to that region to improve the economy, the roads, the plans to get out when there is a flood or to control the flood waters and so on, that would increase the vulnerability of, of the group. And it, inequality, it would place impacts of climate change and burden of adaptation disproportionately on certain groups. It could be women who have to deal with the kids or it could be poorer parts of the same community and so on. So implication for mitigation of each constraining factor uh, ranges from how it affects economic growth, how it affects risk perception and willingness to change behavioral patterns. I will say more about this. So there is always a so-called human dimension. So you have science that is projecting temperature and precipitation changes, wind changes, extreme events, etc. We are converting them into various adaptation and mitigation strategies and then we are looking at the various constraints that may exist and how they will affect the implications for mitigation and adaptation. So divergence in social cultural attitudes affect emission patterns. If you think it is not a big deal to buy a car and drive or a big car, fuel inefficient car and so on or the perception of the society itself on how they view mitigation and policy and technologies. Challenges to governance include undermining policies, incentives, cooperations. All these are being played out right now not only in poor countries but even in the richest of the countries like the US, Canada and Australia for example. So the cultural and perception differences are so stark that the European countries are dealing with the issues at a governance level very differently than let's say US or even Australia. This always matters because it also aggregates to a global level especially as CO2 begins to continues to build up and accelerate. Lack of access reduces capacity of developed and particularly developing nations. So the inequality is also at this kind of global level. Inadequate technology would slow down the rate at which society can reduce carbon intensity and quality and quantity of natural resources obviously affect long term sustainability of energy technologies. The deficits reduce the mitigative capacity and undermine international cooperation. So a country like Bangladesh which is not able to let's say come up with the finances to mitigate and adapt at its own level. If it does not get somehow helped with its development deficit then it may refuse to cooperate with somebody who may be seen as dictating something from outside. The inequality constraints in terms of mitigation, the ability of developing nations with low income levels and different communities or sectors within nations to contribute to greenhouse gas mitigation. So if there is a Paris Agreement and everybody comes to the table and commits voluntarily to reduce certain amounts and then when they begin to implement, if there is inequality in sharing technology, science, innovations, then obviously this can become uh, an issue.
So let's look at some more uh, approaches to managing the risks of climate change through adaptation. Again, lots of details, but you should be able to go through the tables and then maybe when you set the exams or quizzes and so on, you can choose local issues and ask the students to come up with ideas for adaptation and mitigation. So if you are exposed to this range of issues and the options for adaptation, the approaches for managing risk with adaptation, then you can ask them to use that knowledge to come up with their own solutions in a local setting. So this is for, they are not all independent, the various approaches. So they will be overlapping as we will see, but I will just split the table into vulnerability and exposure reduction, which includes categories of human development, poverty alleviation, livelihood security, disaster management, risk management, ecosystem management, and spatial and land use uh, planning. Each one comes with an example, for example, Ecosystem management includes maintaining wetlands, urban green spaces, coastal afforestation, watershed reservoir management, reduction of other stresses on the ecosystems, community-based natural resource management, and so on. So if you are in a region and it has some specific issue of a lot of floods or cyclones or has a lot of poverty, then what would be the kind of adaptation plans you would come up with given the cultural setting, the distribution of population, natural resources, uh, and so on, okay? So that's just few examples. As for adaptation, including incremental and transformational adjustments, there are structural and physical categories of uh, adaptation, institutional and social. So this is very critical, each one of them easier to probably buy and implement these than these because ecosystem based options often required things like ecological restoration, soil conservation, afforestation, reforestation, mangrove conservation and so on, fisheries, co-management. Each one requires participation from the actors or players who are involved in exploiting the ecosystems soils for agriculture or gardening or lawns or building or whatever, forest areas, mangroves, who owns them, who would pay for restoring them, who would work to restore them, who would do something upstream. For example, mangroves can be destroyed by nutrient pollution, let's say, coming from the rivers. And the river runs hundreds of miles, if not thousands of miles. So people all up the river have to worry about, like the Ganga pollution, who's responsible for it? Who's going to pay for the cleaning? Central government has taken it on. Who's going to do the work? How long it will take and, and so on. So it's also very difficult when we come to institutional op uh, category uh, because it has economic options, law and regulation, national government policies and programs. So the process of implementing uh, the options and setting laws and regulations and then making sure that it is followed by the local governments, the state governments, etc. Often requires things like financial incentives, insurance, catastrophe bonds, uh, land zoning laws, national regional adaptation plans, and so on and so forth. So it gets very detailed. So it's worth going through and seeing the range of things. It's even more demanding when you think about social options like educational, informational, and behavioral options. So awareness raising and integration into education. So courses like this are part of that education system so that the hope is teachers get educated and become aware of the climate variability, change, risks, adaptation options, mitigation options, and the categories and then pass on the knowledge and prepare the newer generations to be fully aware, globally aware of all the risks and ways to reduce the risks through adaptation approaches. So things like gender equality in education, extension services, sharing indigenous traditional local knowledge, everything is kind of going on at various levels.
through governments, through NGOs, through various initiatives, novel degrees, sustainability, rural development kind of degrees, or newer universities which focus on rural development and so on. But we know that they are not easy. Gender equity in education, how easy is it? What are the other externalities like how the girl gets married if she's educated versus uneducated, etc. All kinds of factors play into it. Informational options, hazard and vulnerability mapping happening through ISRO and institutes like IITs, early warnings and response systems happening through India Meteorology Department and uh, various uh, weather services like the National Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, also part of the Ministry of Earth Science in India, but there are many such agencies across the world. Systematic monitoring and remote sensing climate services. This is a phrase that has evolved in the last five to ten years. It's basically, there has been established weather services. Now we are going into longer time scale called climate services. So whenever you, you are flying, for example, and suddenly the flight gets cancelled because of weather, it's because they are taking the weather pro forecast seriously and changing the schedule of the flights or cancelling them and so on. So what are the kind of climate services that also uh, involve uh, decision making? Uh, this is the most difficult one, I would say, behavioral options. So household preparation and evacuation planning, migration, soil and water conservation, storm drain clearance, livelihood diversification, changed cropping, livestock, aquaculture practices, reliance on social networks. Very easy to list these sorts of things, but how to actually get participation? That is a huge, huge challenge because human beings have a mental model about everything. If you say there is a risk of flooding tomorrow, some people may take it seriously. Some people may say, oh, they always say this, it never happens. And some people may not even get to hear it because they are not paying attention and so on. So. To change actually the behavior of the people to say, take this seriously. And it, there are examples where like 2003, huge floods in the UK. After the floods, they were told that global warming increased the probability of these floods. So they then began to take some action like being careful about energy use, reducing their emissions. But after four or five years, when nothing else happened, they slowly began to forget that they were doing these things for a reason. So keeping the engagement for a long time is also a serious problem. So there are many complicating human issues involved in this, which extends into kind of social category as well. So we looked at those. So spheres of change, there are practical, political, and personal spheres, social, technical innovations, behavioral shifts, institutional and managerial changes political, social, cultural, ecological decisions. So I will show examples of leaders of some nations who were considered very friendly to awareness of climate change. Apparently were taking actions to reduce their impact on climate, but they were always constrained by the choices. The political situation is always such that they have to win the next election or they have to make sure their party wins the next election. Then. You have to show that you are doing something good, but you may be constrained in other ways. So the choices may not be as beneficial as you think. So it's always complicated. And that's the same even at personal level. I will show an example of how individual and collective assumptions, beliefs and values work, how people think they did something good for climate and then they actually do one thing that is good, but then ignore everything else. So. When you think about personal behavior, you have to think a little bit about how human beings work. So we won't go too much into the details because that get in, gets into how humans have evolved, how we are different than our ancestors like chimpanzees and gorillas and other animals that are living with us uh, and so on. And this also depends on which kind of culture you come from. The Eastern cultures are very different than the Western cultures, etc. But each human being has certain features that are common. So we have what are called norms and punishments. So we have certain 
rules that we all tend to follow. They may be specific to a culture, to a region, to a language, but nonetheless, once we accept certain norms or rules, we internalize them. And the best example I can give you is in a country like the uh, US or Europe, when there is a red light, you have to stop. When there is a green light, you can go, right? Very few people would break this to the extent that even if you are driving in the middle of the night, there is nobody around, nobody watching. Now there are cameras, but even when there were no cameras, if, you, if there was a red light, you would wait for it to change because that is the rule. You wouldn't look around and say, okay, nobody is watching and I will go. That is called internalizing the norm. So you just learn that we should follow rules. And there are changes that happen over time. For example, this is an old ad that said, train her to be an ideal housewife. It was for the Usha sewing machine. Such an ad would be considered completely inappropriate at this point. It is obviously treating women as housewives who have to sit at home and sew things, right? But these are the ads from 2016, which are still not considered completely sensitive. So here it is showing, give your kid a complete makeover. So it is showing this kid as a tomboy or not something a girl should do. And the same girl here sitting dressed completely differently. Why is this wrong and this is right? This is an ad for uh, whatever the jeans that she's wearing and so on. And this is a joke that is silly. It, it says, don't hold back, take your work home. That is obviously not a very smart advertisement. Obviously, they probably pulled it down and it will not be done again. Nonetheless, the culture is constantly learning by making mistakes. How do human actions work? This is a complicated looking diagram, but I will just tell you what is the main message, okay? So here is the excess carbon dioxide you would emit based on whether you are driving a hybrid car like Prius, which emits very less carbon. Compare it to Camry, which is more fuel inefficient, or a SUV, which is even more inefficient than a Camry, and a SUV, which is obviously much more inefficient than a Prius. So your carbon emission goes up as you drive a more fuel inefficient car. Very obvious, right? So many people buy Prius and say, I'm driving a hybrid, so I have done my part for climate change. But what is the problem? If you look at the amount of calories they are getting for their food every day, it depends on how they are getting it, whether they are getting it from something like chicken or from dairy products or from fish and where meat, some diets like the US are and some heavy environmentally unfriendly meats like the red meat like beef and the main message here is that even if you are driving a Prius, a Camry SUV or whatever, if you are a vegetarian, your emission is going to be, so US is somewhere in this range, so if you are eating fish, additional emission will be low, if you are eating chicken, it is somewhere here, if you are eating red meat, it's somewhere here. So even if you are driving a Prius and reducing your emission, if you're eating a lot of meat, your emission will be higher than somebody who is a vegetarian and is driving an SUV, okay? Let me say that again. Even if you're driving an SUV, if you're a vegetarian, your carbon footprint may be lower than somebody who's driving a Prius but is eating a lot of meat because the meat production has a huge carbon footprint in terms of the land it uses, the grains, the grass uh, and so on. So we cannot do just one thing and think we solved the climate problem or we did our part. We have to pay attention to so many things. So I will come back to that. Can we really expect people to constantly worry about everything? Is that how we are going to solve the climate problem? Very difficult to imagine that will be the solution, right? So nonetheless, right now we have to keep that in mind. So how do human beings make a decision. So everybody has what is called a emotional elephant. There's a part of the brain called amygdala which takes past experiences and converts it into a stimulus so that when you experience a stimulus, it 
response based on the past experience, so it is uh, based out of fear or emotion. It's, it's called a evolutionary alarm bell, which is very useful because if you see fire, you will move away. If you see a snake, it, you will move away and so on. And there is a rational rider which makes you think and it is the rational part of the brain. There are lots of details that show that actually it's not so rational. It keeps thinking, it keeps delaying decisions. It takes so-called wait and see attitude. So if you say there's a climate risk, it will say, well, we don't know how big the risk is. You don't know when it will come. So it will just keep delaying the decision. So it doesn't look for ways to make a quick decision. It just keeps rationalizing. Sometimes it's, there is even something called rational ignorance. It ignores things that it doesn't want to deal with. Whereas the emotional elephant, which is slow to move, that's why it's an elephant. Once it emotionally identifies with something, if you are somebody who believes in climate change, then you might begin to do things on your own, like saving water, energy, eating less meat, uh, being friendly to the environment, driving less, etc. And the human decision happens when both the rational rider and the emotional elephant want to go in the same direction. Elephant likes a clear path and a destination, so it needs to know why I'm going here, where is the path, and I will go there. So human mind is basically split. There's an emotional part and there's a rational part. This is common to all the people. Some people are more emotional than others, some people are more rational than others, but nonetheless big decisions often involve both things. And this also op op operates at larger scales. So I will give you an example. Angela Merkel, who is the German Chancellor, is considered a climate chancellor. This is a recent article for a long time since the 80s, she has been considered environmentally friendly. And all the German companies are considered very proactive on climate change. But what did Volkswagen do? They started completely cheating on emission tests. They just sold cars, millions of them, saying that these are very fuel efficient, even though they were diesel. Remember, diesel puts out more carbon per liter than petrol, or petrol puts more than gas, of course. So they were caught cheating on the emission test. They were just cheating on the computer software. They were fined 1 billion euros, which is one of the largest fines ever paid by a corporation. So corporations want to make money, want to make profit. They also want to depict themselves as environmental friendly. If they do it by cheating, then we know, we, you know we are in trouble, right? And it's not just a, a joke because the study then from MIT shows that Volkswagen's excess emissions will lead to 1,200 premature deaths in Europe, okay? So actually there is a cost associated with such cheating. So another example I can give you is from the US. So this is now Germany burning still coal, coal-fired power plants and transport will make the country miss its 2020 climate target by a wider margin than previously anticipated. So Germany is doing lots of things like solar and wind, but it's still burning a lot of coal, and it has companies like Volkswagen who cheated. So we have to constantly be sure that actually we are doing something that is net positive and not doing something here and cheating bigger over there, okay? So Japan is embracing coal power basically because when the earthquake happened, there was a tsunami, the tsunami then affected the nuclear plant, which broke down, released a lot of nuclear emission, and that led Japan to say, we should be careful about nuclear, and then they started to go back to coal. So an unfortunate event that is not even climate, earthquake, caused an accident that is by tsunami, and that leads to a decision that is going to affect climate in a very bad way. So there are always these unexpected problems that can occur and how do we stay on target? That's always critical. So that goes to adaptation approaches in terms of governance, institutional, social, political, economic, and, and so on. So this is about Obama who was considered 
one of the most climate friendly uh, presidents, even though he could not get his Congress to approve signing on to the Paris Climate Agreement. He went and convinced all the countries including China and India that they should participate. Very nice, India and China are in fact participating and doing their best, whereas he actually told he will cut carbon pollution, but in the meantime the coal miners kept on producing more coal and they were just exporting the coal to places like Germany and China. So their own emission may go down, but they are just exporting their emissions. So how does it help in the global governance or global reduction of carbon emission? So the coal burning continues. In 2012, there was 7.6 billion tons of coal consumed worldwide, 7.89 billion tons of coal produced. So there is more burnt, more produced than consumed. And there is a 105% change in global consumption in coal since 1980. So if you look at the energy consumption produced by British Petroleum, you can see that from 92 to 2017, this is the energy consumption. And I think I made a mistake and put the same one twice. This is coal production by consumption in regions in millions of tons of oil equivalent. So when you have coal, you convert the carbon into oil equivalent, which is just a way of keeping the same units. And you can see that Africa, Middle East, Asia Pacific and so on. So Asia Pacific dominates the consumption and their consumption is going up over this time, whereas North America is, is reducing basically because of partly to economic slowdown, financial crises, etc., because it's going back up again at the end. And also because they switched to natural gas, the huge source was found in the U.S. and so on. And Asia has now booming economies like India and China, which are going to burn more. And you cannot really tell them to not burn because they need to grow and get their people out of the poverty that they have been in for a long time. The externality or the cost of burning all this fossil fuel to grow economically is of course that pollution is increasing exponentially. This is a picture you know from where. And most pollution linked deaths are now occurring in India. We are now worse than China because China is taking some action and trying to reduce their emission. So potential trade-offs that you can find by using adaptation options by specific management objectives that are listed in uh, the IPCC report. You can look at different sectors like agriculture, biodiversity, coasts, water management. The actors' objectives are obviously to increase drought resistance and pet resistance and increase yields, for example, or enhance the capacity of natural adaptation and migration. So if you have a mangrove forest, if you remove it, storm surge and inundation is going to get worse, especially with sea level rise. The contamination of groundwater is going to increase, Saliniz salinization is going to increase because of sea level rise and groundwater contamination. And the pollution in the ocean is coastal waters is also going to increase because mangroves basically act as a filter of the nutrients and other contaminants that come in from the rivers and the water is filtered as it goes into the coastal ocean. So all those kinds of natural adaptation migration changes are related to things like biodiversity. Coasts of, of course provide near term protection to financial assets from inundation and so on if you have proper adaptation plan. And increasing water source reliability and drought resilience or maximizing efficiency of water management, etc., are typical adaptation objectives. And the options range from biotechnology and genetically modified crops, obviously not always accepted, there is a lot of controversies, subsidized drought resistance, crop insurances, increased use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides and organic farming, organic fertilizers, organic pesticides to reduce the impact on soil health and water quality. 
migration corridor. So you create and you fractionate the, the forest or urbanize or deforest for agriculture. You provide corridors through which certain species can migrate and survive under climate change. Protection of critical habitat for vulnerable species happens a lot to anywhere from tiger species to birds to elephants and many other butterflies, etc. Assisted migration, there are many examples where animals are being moved actually to help. Sea walls managed retreat, not always easy to tell people to move away from where they have been living or where they want to live. Migration out of low-lying areas, again not easy. Desalination is now more and more common and the critical issue is there at what scale can we continue it because when you desalinate, you are going to release the salt from the water. Where are you going to put the water and how is it going to affect the coastal water, ocean water or the, the ecosystem? Because salinity also changes the alkalinity and hence the pH of the water in the ocean. So it's not easy. Just like carbon capture and sequestration, you need to find a way to sequester the carbon for a long time in a safe way. That's the same in this case. Water trading, there are what is called virtual hydrology because each time you export fruits, vegetables and grains, you are essentially exporting water, right? So for countries like Pakistan and India, which are exporting huge amounts of vegetables, rice and fruits, for example, they are essentially also exporting a lot of water. Or even within the country, there may be a Pepsi bottling plant in a place where there is not a lot of water, groundwater is being used and those Pepsis are being exported to a place like Mumbai where it's hot and humid, people drink a lot of it, but Mumbai has a lot of water compared to other places. So you are moving water in the wrong direction. So adaptation option has to basically take into account those kinds of things and of course water recycling and use. There are also receive a real and perceived trade-offs which involve public health and safety, moral hazards and distributional inequalities. Every time you do adaptation to change resource allocation, distribution, protection, you have to always worry about who gets affected in what way by it. Discharge of nutrients and chemical pollution, concerns over property rights when you create these kind of corridors, every time you build common roadways or bridges or whatever, you always have these issues. Again, concerns over property rights. It's sometimes difficult to predict the ultimate success. So if you create assisted migration of, let's say, some species of animal or bird or insect from one location to another, you are making an experiment without knowing whether that will succeed or not. That can be an issue. There are direct and opportunity costs. Opportunity cost basically means when you spend money on one thing, you have moved it from something else. So if you spent it on this, what would be the net value as opposed to where you put it? Or if you don't put it there and spend it here, then what is the opportunity lost by doing that choice? So these are always very difficult. And of course, there are equity concerns when you deal with uh, coastal modifications. Governance challenges are always an issue. Place and cultural identity, erosion of kinship and familial ties, ecological risks of saline discharge, as I mentioned in desalination. This is undermines public good and social aspects of water. When you do water trading, and there are many places where it's privatized and so on, there is always an issue of whether water is a basic right and whether it should be privatized or whether it should be a government service and how do you ensure equality, how do you deal with water as a public good versus private commodity and what are the social aspects of it and so on. And there are perceived risks to public health and safety every time you change the way you water, recycle and reuse water. There are some people who may be very sensitive to it. This goes even for things like composting toilets, which you will see ads on TV. Mr. Akshay Kumar saying how safe it is, but how many people are comfortable dealing with it? 
this is something uh, we have to worry about. So this is a figure that is showing direct CO2 emissions by major sectors and non-CO2 emissions which is basically methane, nitrous oxide and so on for baseline which is high emission where we do not do anything and mitigation scenarios. So how effective can mitigation be according to these projections? Here you are showing direct emissions for various scenarios, baseline, the low emissions and you go these are the various number of uh, simulations or scenarios by different models and these are the different sectors. Transport sector, buildings, industry, electricity, net AFOLU, you remember this is agriculture, forestry and other land use and non-CO2 emissions. So, what is the range? So, depending on the time period and the sector, you have different ranges. So, for example, for electricity, which is now one of the largest emitters, you see that the totals are going above 80 gigatons carbon dioxide per year by the time you reach 2100. But the others are more in the 30, 40, 50 range, mostly under 30, but it is the cumulative emission that matters of course. But why do we do it by sector? Because it allows you to track where the chances or opportunities or potential for mitigation is high. Obviously, electricity production has a high opportunity for mitigation. You can bring hopefully this down by using some of course renewables, but also capturing carbon at the source like a coal burning power plant or hydroelectric power plant. Does it allow you to capture carbon where it is being produced? As a many, many cars are moving around or airplanes are moving around, trains, trucks, it is hard to capture carbon on each unit. It can get expensive because right now we do not have a very efficient technology unless we start burning uh, hydrogen and produce only uh, water as a, as a waste or something. As long as we are burning some form of fossil fuel, collecting at each distributed source they are called is very difficult whereas these are so called point sources where emission is occurring at where the production is happening. So mitigation scenarios allow you to look sector by sector and say where are the opportunities for further mitigation. These already include some mitigation but where are the other opportunities. So we will come back and look at the again the mitigation scenarios, but this time with and without CCS. CCS is this buzzword as I said, carbon capture and sequestration or carbon dioxide capture and sequestration. There is also something called CDR which is carbon dioxide removal. So all these are important because the big plans we make for very, very low emissions must have some mitigation technology like CCS. If it is not available, obviously meeting the goals of emissions uh, and accumulated carbon is going to be very difficult. So we will come back and continue next time. See you next time.